Um, we can open up the floor to questions. Um, let's see. You can either type it into the chat and or you can just, uh, if you're able to, just raise your hand and then I'll call on you. Yeah, Kirk. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about the 423. Do you know the actual names and how old they were when they got involved and so forth? I do have their names uh, in the book. They, they escaped me at this moment. Um, I do know that the uh, number of the Fort Hood Three uh, were also involved in the W.E.B. Du Bois clubs and that uh, I think they only spent about two, maybe two and a half years in, in uh, military prison. And, and if I'm not mistaken, it was in the fall of 20 uh, of 1968 that uh, they were freed and it was uh, you know the the party of course was very much a part of the four hood three defense committee um and uh uh yeah and then you know the, the number of other uh soldiers white and african-american puerto rican uh latino soldiers after their example um, started resistant to deploy as well, and it really became the genesis of the GI uh, anti-war resistance uh, the Fort Hood Three did. So um, I can look it up, uh, look up the names exactly. They just they escape me right now, um, uh, but I'd be happy to share that with folks. One of them was uh, named Mora. Yes, yes, Elena's right. uncle. Elena's uncle. Correct, correct. And I think maybe a JJ Johnson. Does that sound right? Uh, Maura Johnson and, uh, oh my goodness, I'm sorry, <laughs> too much information. We have a question here from Arthur. Uh, what do you think of the modern prospects of popular front tactics and why do so many communists confuse the popular front period and the united front period? Well, Good I, can't, question. <laughs> I, I can't speculate on, on, on other people um, and, and, and confusions. Um, I can say that I think that the popular front, you know, has, has proven to be a really powerful, uh, you know, tactic by which communists can build broad-based unity and, and that that tactic remains as uh, powerful and relevant today as it was when it was first initiated. Um, in the 1930s, and so, um, so yeah. I mean, I think I think you know when when things are useful, you, you keep doing them, <laughs> and said when things uh, cease to be useful, you start to look for other uh, strategies and tactics. And so, I, I think that uh, you know, as long as as long as that tactic remains useful, you'll find that communists uh, employ it. Um, I have a, uh, oh, someone else have a question. I was getting feedback. I have a quick question. Um, how long were the, the jail sentences for the leadership of the party uh, when they were indicted? How much time did they have to serve? And I remember briefly that socialist countries at the time offered uh, medical treatment or, or you know, a shelter uh, for some party members. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the, the length of time where in that people were sentenced depended on the individual. Um, you know, some individuals were attacked more severely than, than others. And, and, you know, and, and those, uh, what, what, what historians have called second and third tier, you know, communists, um, you know, served significantly less time than first tier communists, partly because of the, uh, fight back that was waged, partly because victories had been won against these unconstitutional uh, McCarran and Smith acts, um, you know, but for a number of different reasons. Um, communists like uh, Gus Hall, who at first evaded uh, F the FBI and, and went underground and, and decided that he and Henry Winston and Gil Green and other comrades would not uh, turn themselves in uh, initially. Uh, when he was when, when Gus Hall was eventually captured in in Mexico, um, you know, a number of years were was added to his sentence because of because he fled 
um, and went underground. And so the, the, the length of time that people spent in prison varied depending on a number of different circumstances and, and, and factors. Um, the question about the Soviet Union acting as a safe haven is a really important question because a number of communists uh, like Henry Winston, who, as I mentioned earlier, um, due to prison negligence, lost his eyesight while in prison, was eventually granted presidential clemency and then left for the Soviet Union where he stayed, I think, from 1961 to 1964. You know, he, along with other prominent African Americans, for example, uh, you know, like Ollie Harrington, who was a Communist Party member and cartoonist, um, the fact that they found more freedom within the world of 20th century communism really complicates mm -hmm. our history of U.S. civil rights and, and call, you know, challenges that, that narrative. And I think that that's something that we as communists have to be, be aware of, is that, you know, there was this very powerful other that existed at the time that could provide uh, not only political and organizational aid, but also provide morale um, and provide a space where um, communists like Henry Winston, who had been, who had lost his eyesight, had gone blind uh, due, due to will, I'm going to say willful negligence, you know, um, could find a safe haven within the Soviet Union. And he wasn't the only, I mentioned Ollie Harrington earlier, the fact that he spent most of his later years in the GDR is another example of the German Democratic Republic. Um, Alpheus Hunton is another example that as he was being blacklisted and ousted from, uh, and, and the, CA, the Council on African Affairs was being dissolved, um, he was able to find uh, support in the Eastern European states and the Soviet Union as well. Um, and, you know, examples could go on and on and on. Um, Henry Winston, in a correspondence between him and James Jackson, another prominent African American party leader, um, Jackson noted um, uh, his, his uh, passport had been confiscated and he was unable to travel. And he, he kind of made a point of, uh, as soon as these uh, unconstitutional travel bans are, are restricted, I hope that I can come and visit you and enjoy, enjoy some socialist uh, hospitality. Um, and so, um, so this wasn't something that, uh, you know, this isn't something that we should forget or ignore, is that there was this very, very powerful other political force um, that at the time was actually in ascendance. You know, the Soviet Union and the socialist states uh, made up one third of the world's populations. Another third of the world's populations were in the throes of revolution for national independence. And so there was every reasonable, you know, you, you could reason with, with a you know, high degree of uh, certainty that the world was turning socialist, that, that things were moving in a certain direction um, because of these uh, global uh, changes that were taking place inspired by the Russian Revolution and the Bolsheviks taking of power. Um, so anyway, so, uh, so yeah, so having that, you know, ability to show support internationally was very impactful. Um, you know, uh, Alpheus Hunton would also receive royalty payments for his book being published and translated uh, in, in the numerous languages of the Eastern European states, um, similar, similarly with other communists. And so this was another way that uh, support was shown. You know, uh, Alpheus Hunton was also provided with um, regular medical and health uh, uh, checkups uh, when he would travel abroad as just part of the ways that the Soviet Union and the Eastern European states showed solidarity um, with, with, you know, domestic communists. Yeah, it's incredible. I had no idea about much of this history, but especially that part. Um, we have another question here from Arthur. It is no secret that among young communists in the United States, the CPUSA is seen as liberal and or not radical enough. What do you think draws so many young communists, particularly in the West, to more ultra left and tactic averse politics? What can the party do to combat this? Last one, I promise. Art. <laughs> well, you know, I, I was once young. <laughs> um, I'm 42, so I'm still seen as young by many of the uh, the elders. Um, but I've got 23 years of uh, concerted uh, organizing experience under my belt, and I know that when I joined 
the Communist Party. Um, I definitely had a ultra left ish uh, romanticized version of you know of the Communist Party and of the prospects for revolution in our country. And what I found as I not only matured in age, but matured in, in politics was that experience is a harsh teacher. Um, and that my experiences as a grassroots community organizer, as a trade union organizer, as a uh, activist and organizer leader of the Communist Party is that the day-to-day -day, uh, grunt work of building a movement it teaches us a lot of really important lessons and that that romanticism that I initially had as a young man, um, you know, has, has faded, though my, though my uh, beliefs in socialism have been strengthened due to the experiences that I have and due to the history that I've, that I've learned. You know, my, my mentors here in St. Louis were uh, and are, remain, you know, prominent leaders of the uh, black community. You know, they're black communists in the coalition of uh, CB2, the coalition of black trade unionists, uh, African-American elected officials who happen to be members of the Communist Party, as well as other union leaders uh, that mentored me in, in my political development when I was in my late teens and early 20s and continue to do so today. Um, and it was their experiences, the relationships that they've built over many decades of struggle and the changes that they've helped to bring about over many decades of struggle that continue to strengthen my belief in socialism long after my initial kind of youthful romanticism and energy uh, have, have died down. <laughs> I definitely don't have the energy that I used to have, but I, but I remain as committed as ever because of the experiences of these, of, the, of these comrades who mentored me when I was much younger. Um, and so I think that's part of the answer of why a number of young people join and maybe they have a different perception of the party is that that's just part of, part of being youth, um, part of being new to the movement, part of not having the decades of uh, concerted grassroots political experience that, that uh, you know, the people who mentored me had. And, and it's a, you know, it's an important lesson to learn. And I hope that, you know, uh, many, many of those young people stick around to learn to learn those experiences, and uh, maybe the political climate and political situation will change more dramatically and more quickly for this generation than it did for mine and for the prior generations. I know uh, sometimes politics can take years and decades, and sometimes years and decades can be encapsulated within days. And so, um, who's who's to know for sure? But I but I definitely encourage the. Uh, you know, the, the discussion and the, uh, you know, uh, thought that goes into what it means to be a member of the Communist Party and, and how we can uh, carry on this uh, historical uh, legacy that is now 100 years old. And we have uh, another question here from James. Go ahead, James. Hey, so I, uh, I tried to post this in the chat, but I messed up and it won't let me copy. Um, so in how, in your opinion, can communists, especially members of the CPUSA, but possibly like uh, members of parties like PSL, um, oh shoot, FRSO, P uh, PCUSA, um, like, you know, parties that don't necessarily have our uh, connect international connections with SolidNet and whatnot. Um, going forward, especially in our trying times to, um, uh, especially coming with like possible political rep repression, um, maybe a renewing of tactics like Smith Act. Um, uh, oh, I'm forgetting the other one, Mc McLaren Act. Oh, anyway, um, yeah, McCarran. Um, and, uh, you know, build popular front networks and united friends with other communists, communist adjacent organizations, uh, you know, to not let possible repression destroy the movement of building socialism. Well, I think the most important thing that we can do to fight and fight back against the repression um, is to organize with the broadest forces possible. You know, um, one thing that I've uh, learned in my experiences and I think is true of the communists who have mentored me is that the role of the party isn't necessarily to organize the left. Um, the left by itself is not gonna be able to win the significant 
changes to our democracy and to our economy that we need to build socialism. Um, we have to organize among much broader forces. And so, you know, uh, here in St. Louis, I can say, you know, with complete certainty that, that our work has not been to organize different uh, Marxist or communist or socialist groups or whatever into a coalition of the left. So that's, that's not really our mission. Our mission here in St. Louis has been to help to organize and, and build relationships among the various mass forces uh, that have tens of thousands of members here in St. Louis. And so, you know, the various unions that we work with, the various uh, constituency groups, I mentioned the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists um, as one example. Um, there are a number of other examples, you know, our work with the St. Louis Workers Education Society was definitely an effort to uh, build a popular front type coalition um, around uh, unions and community groups and religious institutions and student groups um, to fight back and not only, not only to fight back, but to fight proactively for things that we want to see happen that get us a little bit closer to a political environment to where socialism is possible. And so, you know, I would urge uh, communists uh, to not look at how do we organize the left, but how do we organize and embrace and build upon the broader forces of the union groups and, uh, uh, you know, those, you know, the broad-based student organizations, the United States Student Association, uh, Jobs with Justice, um, and other groups um, that have a much larger base than we do a uh, much larger base than all of the communist and Marxist organizations combined, and how do we build uh, amongst those groups, um, I think is the real test, not how do we build amongst, uh, you know, other Marxist or other communists, and so um, that's, that's my take on it, that's how I approach this question, that's how we've approached the question here in St. Louis and in other parts of our district, um, is that the goal is to build amongst broad-based forces, um, and, and to fight for tangible, winnable uh, uh, goals like, you know, raising the minimum wage or expanding Medicaid, Medicare, uh, getting big money out of politics, uh, those types of things. Uh, you know, here in Missouri, uh, one of the main things that we've fought against over the years is to defeat right to work, um, to make sure that workers still have a voice in the workplace. Um, so I think that those are very important, very tangible, very concrete uh, campaigns that uh, communists can uh, add our class analysis to and add our politics to and help to build a broad-based uh, popular front type coalition around um, that maybe some of these other groups are ill-equipped to do. And so that's what I would suggest. Excellent. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. I completely agree. Thank you for hashing that out for us. Any other questions? Do you have time for another question, Tony? Yeah, let's do maybe one more. Sure. Another question? Joe, go ahead, Joe. Not a question, so maybe you should also take a question. Just an anecdote that I loved your, your, your report. And my first election that I was, I had to wait till I was 21 back then to vote. And the first election I was able to vote for was 1968. And uh, you, you go to vote, and I was in Minnesota. And there was Charlene Mitchell. So the first person I voted for the top of the ballot was mm -hmm. communist. She was only on in, the, in Minnesota as a, as a communist and in Washington state under another name. But even that took a appeals court decision to, to put it on the ballot. And that was the first time the party ran candidates since before the Second World War. Yeah, yeah, it had been decades. So it, just was, it was historical and I'm so proud. I bet one of 500 people that voted for her and I, when I met her years later, this was way before I joined the party, when I, but I actually petitioned for her too. I went out and knocked on doors and helped petition for her in the summer. Uh, and when, you know, I, re I met her at one of the party conventions or meetings and I, I introduced myself and I said, you know, I voted for you for president and she started jumping up and down. <laughs> Well, you know, an interesting story, I think this is important to point out, and I, I didn't mention it earlier, um, is that, you know, some, some people might draw the, uh, the wrong conclusion that due to the low 
votes, the low numerical votes for Mitchell at that time in 1968. I mean, as you mentioned, she only ended up being on the ballot in, in two states, I think. And so, um, so people say, oh, there were only, you know, 1,500 votes or 2,000 votes or whatever it was cast for, for Charlene. That must, that must mean there's no support for communists. And, and that would be a very uh, uh, incorrect conclusion to draw because if we look at just one other example, from 1966, uh, Dorothy Haley ran for office in LA, um, a very, very well-known communist, a very, very well-known communist at the time. Um, and she ended up receiving somewhere in the ballpark of 70,000 votes in LA County alone um, for and, and, you know, as a communist. And so I think that this idea that just because Charlene was only on the ballot in two states or only received a small number of votes that there wasn't support for communists is a very um, you know, incorrect conclusion to draw if we broaden our scope and look at other communist candidates uh, after, you know, before and after, we find that there continues to be considerable support for communist candidates throughout the decades, even into the 1980s and 90s when uh, Evelina Alarcon in, in, uh, in California uh, ran for uh, state's attorney or something like that, a, a statewide position, and she ended up getting somewhere in the ballpark of 115,000 votes um, as a well-known communist candidate. Um, uh, my own experiences uh, here in St. Louis, one of my mentors, uh, Kenny Jones, uh, was a well-known communist, became a, a member of our Board of Aldermen in 1983. Um, you know, throughout the 1980s, hundreds of thousands, and I'm going to say that again, hundreds of thousands of votes were cast for communist candidates throughout the country, um, despite decades and decades of political repression, despite the ongoing, uh, uh, you know, Reagan era attacks on the Soviet Union and the evil empire, you know, quote, unquote, um, still hundreds of thousands of votes were cast for communists. Um, and, and I think that, uh, you know, even today, though, though small in number, communists continue to hold uh, public office around the country and uh, make important contributions to the fight for, uh, you know, workers' rights, peace, solidarity, equality, etc. And so, uh, so yeah, it's an important important distinction to make there. And the last time Lorenzo Torres ran for legislature in Arizona, he got thirty percent of the votes in his district in 1990. My, my, my own election uh, in twenty March of twenty nineteen, I got forty eight percent of the vote. I lost by fifty two votes, um, and that was after. Uh, numerous uh, months of dirty tricks and red bait and, and attacks from the mayor's office and the St. Louis Police Officers Association. There were actually four billboards around my house, within a mile of my house, uh, talking about uh, communism and the, uh, you know, something, the victims of communism billboards, you know, 100, 100 years, 100 million dead, some bullshit like that. And there were these four billboards around my house uh, directed at, my, at me and my campaign. Um, and yet, despite all of that, I still received 48% of the vote and lost by only 52 votes. And so, uh, so yeah, so I think that there's a lot that we can point to that are really uh, important examples of the level of uh, support for uh, candidates uh, who either run in publicly as communists or as part of broad coalitions uh, are able to, to, to make. A lot of really great contributions. Do you have any final, final quick questions or comments? Yeah, this is Kirk. Uh, Go ahead, Kirk. Have you seen Henry Louis Gates' Encyclopedia Africana? I, I don't think I've seen Gates's. No. Yeah, it was published in the early two thousands, and his story is that. He's uh, completing Du Bois's vision. Okay, that's uh, wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, I I know that the project after the coup, the project was put on hiatus. Uh, Alpheus Hunton had hoped to continue the project, um, but the the funding for it dried up, and the uh, uh, you know the political climate in Ghana had changed pretty quite dramatically. Um, and and you know I kind of lose track of the story after Hunton's passing in 70, 71 thereabouts. Um, and, but I, I would be really excited to hear that uh, someone like Gates would be uh, taking up the project or other historians, you know, take up the project and it become 
uh, what Du Bois envisioned. That would be that would be great. Yeah, it's out. It's out there. Uh, there's a uh, library edition, and then there's a popular edition. Wonderful. Wonderful. That's it. Well, with that, thank you so much, Tony, for coming on today and being so generous with your time. Um, I appreciate all the work you've done on behalf of the party and collecting our history. I personally learned so much and it's incredibly inspiring to me. Um, and just your work makes me want to go out there and organize all the more. So I appreciate you. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you. And that, that makes it all worthwhile. That was the goal. <laughs> Not only tell our history, but to inspire people. So I, yeah. I hope that it has inspired at least some people to, to take action and help build, uh, help build, you know, socialism for the 21st century. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's get to it. Let's do it. <laughs> Again, right. Thank you, Tony. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Tony. Thank you.